Amen. So first, I always like to look at definitions um, when we look at, uh, when, we, when I want to bring forth word. And so firstly, I went into the dictionary and the first thing I looked up is, what does the word bravery mean? I was quite surprised. I was really shocked. I found my name next to that. Really? You don't believe me? Go and look it up. You will see the name Tamara Pele. It says, brave to take up the mic when she's not a preacher. <laughs> brave to stand in Siloam and bring forth word on how to be brave when her husband is a much more seasoned preacher. I didn't tell her to say that. <laughs> Brave to put a person out of their comfort zone to, to expound on God's word. This is something you know I would never, ever have thought of doing. Amen. But Deuteronomy 31 verse 6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. This is among many other scriptures in our motivation to be brave, that the Lord is with us no matter what, and he will never leave us, nor will he forsake us. So to really look at the definition of the word bravery, when I looked it up, it said the ability to face and endure danger or pain. That's a big one, to endure danger or pain showing courage or to endure and face unpleasant conditions without showing fear. With this in mind, we're excited for this theme today, the way of the brave. And it's a message we've entitled, The Brave Believer. Amen. Be courageous and showing strength in the face of fear. Not just brave in the normal way, but brave as a child of God. The truth of the matter is, it takes bravery and it takes courage to be a solid believer in today's world. It takes bravery to believe in Christ. Yeah. It takes bravery to be a Christian wife. It takes bravery to be a Christian mom. It takes bravery to be a Christian businesswoman. It takes bravery to be a Christian daughter, to be a Christian South African. Absolutely to be a child of God, to be employed and work as a Christian, to strive for a better life. In all sense of the matter, it takes a lot to be a brave believer. Gladys, it takes bravery. You are the definition this morning of that word. Well done, well done. Now, this morning, we know that the Word of God is anointed, and I feel a lot more comfortable when Bradley takes the piano behind me, my backup, so we feel the presence of God. The Word of God in Matthew 24, if you have your Bibles, and verse 24, uh, sorry, verse 4, Matthew 24, verse 4. Now, if any of you know the book of Matthew and 24, Matthew 24, it's an extremely, extremely challenging portion of Scripture. But follow with me this morning. Jesus answered in verse 4 and he said, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. The word of God goes on to say in verse 9, Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You being whom? The believers, us Christians, us the children of God. And you may be hated by all, will be hated by all nations because of me. Not maybe, you will be. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Yeah. 
I'm here to do the serious stuff, okay? We'll get that out of the way. Okay? But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. 14 says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the world will, and then the end will come. Amen. This morning, my wife is right. The word Tamara definitely describes bravery. From the time we've been married, she's been incredibly brave in many circumstances. I had the opportunity of being there when my two children were being born. And I understand the bravery that she has. There are times in the day, and I'm not exaggerating, at a certain point in the evening, as early as 7 o'clock, I'm in the house, the doors are locked, the alarm is on. I'm not going anywhere else for the rest of the evening. My wife is incredibly brave. Because she'll still be running up and down to get things done and her business, etc. And I'll be, listen, the day is done. You need to be in the house, locked up. In the event of a fight, I'm not exaggerating. The one that's going to stand before me is most likely my wife. <laughs> if someone or someone at school, a teacher or anyone messes with my children, the first one to rock up at school... To sort the problem out is most likely my wife. She is truly incredibly brave. Now in this ministry, in this kingdom, I believe that when the time comes to stand for faith, we need to be brave. The word of God here in Matthew is telling us that we are going to face much. We face much. Now trust me, God will take care of his kingdom. We don't have to be afraid. God will take care of the ministry, we don't have to be afraid. God will take care of his church, we don't have to be afraid. But we have a part to play in it. Time is gone for us to worry about the needs as Pastor Paul Gonzalez preached so well, not so long ago in our church. We need to move to the next level. And hashtag being a brave believer, the crux of our message this morning is defending the faith. Defending the faith. As a child of God, we need to stand and believe on this word of God. The longer we are believers, the more we come to realize that the world that we're living needs Jesus more than ever. Look, Matthew 24 and those few verses that I, I read, you could spend your whole lifetime and ministry expounding and studying that word. It is so powerful. It is prophetic. It has the promises of God. It has instructions of God on how to live in these last days. For the most recent example for me was displayed in the Olympics. Controversial, controversial that the opening ceremony depicted the Last Supper in a derogatory and vulgar manner. Let's not, not, not mess our words around it. We love watching the Olympics, we love watching all sport, but it was very clear to see. Controversial or not, it was a mockery. A clear sign that the things of God are no longer respected. And the things of God are not held in high regard in the nations of this world. Especially the nations that we consider to be first world or Christian nations. Recent global statistics have shown that the fastest growing religion is not Christianity anymore. And that atheism or the non-belief in any God is one of the fastest growing sections right now. Again, don't be alarmed. Don't be worried. But understand the world that we live in. Amen. We have to be brave and stand up when the time calls for our God and our Savior. We are not suggesting violence or aggression, but to show the world and our country and our communities that we are the representatives of Christ. We still believe in the true God. There is a father in heaven and his son, Jesus Christ, is seated right at the right hand and we believe in him. I'm reminded, I'm reminded of David in 1 Samuel verse 17. 
when he went onto the battlefield to face Goliath, when he, he went to check on his brothers, but when he got there, he heard Goliath berating and degrading the Israelites, degrading the God of the Israelites. Amen. And when he saw this and when he heard this, he was angered. It got him upset. He got him to stand up and say, who is this Philistine? Now, David was a smart guy. He first asked, what's in it for David? What's in it for the guy that kills this Philistine? But in return, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he may defy the armies of the living God? It must make us upset. It must make us angry. It must make us stand on our two feet and say, who is this? That defiles this God that I serve. Our prayers should include a prayer to say, God, we stand with every believer around the world. In countries where Christianity is frowned upon, where it's not allowed, we stand with our people all over the world. There are those that are fighting wars. There are those that are in wars because of the name of Jesus. The least we can do is back them in prayer. Back them in fasting. Back them. Our praise can't be about me, 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 I and my family. What we want, what we want, what we need. God knows. Let's stand for every believer around the world. The actions of Goliath and the disrespect he was showing to Israel was unacceptable to David. The crux of our message today is that as believers, we need to be brave in this world. What is even more clear and disturbing for me is the use of social media against the church and against the believer. And how quickly the enemy latches onto something negative that happens in the church. Bad things happen in all religions. There are bad examples in all religions. There are right wings and left wings and extremists in all religions. But it so happens that the agenda against the church, against Christianity, is serious. It's sincere. It's coordinated. When something happens to one of the great preachers on TV, etc., it is quickly put onto social media. And can I tell you, virtually less than 1% of what's on social media is true. That's why I admire Siloam. We are on the platform. We stand for righteousness. We stand for good. Let's admire and support the ministries that are on social media making a difference. Uplifting the name of God. Uplifting the church. Uplifting the ministry. Now I'm not saying that Christians are not fighting back and not standing up. We saw a show of strength in France where the next day believers protested. They came out and they said we will not tolerate this. We will not stand for this. And it showed uh, th that the organizers came back with an apology. They came back with an apology at the least. If you today feel the same way and want to know how to stand upright for our faith, then the Bible is full of examples and full of characters on how to stand for righteousness. Now let's take a look at one of those characters and expound on the one of the great women in the Bible. Woman in the Bible, her name is Deborah. Deborah's story can be found in Judges four and five. You can read this at home; it's really short, but it is so profound to see such a great and powerful woman of God. We find Deborah in a time when the Israelites had wandered away from God. So God chose to punish them and leave them under the hand of King Jabin. The people were suffering so much that they called out to God and said, God, save us. We need a savior. And at the time, God sent Deborah. Deborah was a judge, meaning she was educated and smart. She wasn't just any average woman. She commanded authority. Everything she did, she did it under authority. It was also very rare to find a female judge in those times. She was also a prophetess, meaning that she, she heard the word of God and she spoke as God wanted her to speak. She would hold court under palm trees, which, which made people come to her for wisdom. She helped them with their problems. 
in Deborah's song in, in the book of Judges chapter 5, it refers, she refers to herself as a mother. A mother not only of biological children, but also a mother of the nation, a mother of people. In, and we find ourselves that in, in chapter 5, when she describes herself, she never, ever, as much as she was a woman of such authority and such power, she never described herself as a judge. She never described herself as a wife. She never described herself even as a prophetess, but rather she chose the term mother. She felt that in, in all her power that God had given her, she felt that it was her will to mother the people around her. And when we look at a mother, a mother comes with such caring and nurturing properties. You will not find a mother being so wrathful like a husband would, like a father. A mother is there to nurture and to help to grow, to look at difficulties and say, how can we solve them in the most caring way? Not to bring a sword and a rat to destroy everything that is around. As the story goes, God revealed the word that, but, let me start that again. As the story goes, she received word from God uh, to Barak, to tell Barak that he must go out into the battlefield and God will help him win the fight. Barak had so much trust in her as a woman. He said, if you go, I will go. But if you do not go, I am not going. I am staying here, lady. You know what? You have the ear of God. What God says, clearly you know what he's saying. So if you're not going, I'm not going. I, I, I want to win this battle. Deborah says, surely I will go. When, when I saw that part of the scripture, I said, you know, to, in today's world, how many of us say, surely I will go. This, there's a war happening on the other side. It's a war against our Christian belief. Surely me, you can put me on the list, I will go. I will leave everything that I have behind and I will go forth and speak the word of God. Man, you know, really, I would have loved to have met her. To know that there is someone around, a woman, not just a man, a woman that was that strong to say, you know what? I know I have God with me and God inside of me. And it is with that God that I will go out into the battlefield. She shows strong leadership and courage in the face of adversity. All the while, she is backed by her faith in God and the word of God. Barak goes into battle and with the enemy led by General Sisera, Barak fights the battle, and with the help of the Lord, he defeats the enemy. So, automatically now, I've introduced a new character, and that's the General Sisera. Now, at this point of the story, we know that Deborah was the brave one. She went into battle. I mean, like, if I have to say, listen, I'm going into battle, you're going to look at me and say, yo, she's a brave one. Hey? But there's another heroine that enters this picture. And her name is Yael or Jael. She's part of a nomadic tribe moving from place to place. So she's a woman who's not grounded or centered in a specific place. She's a woman who's not an Israelite. She's a Kenite. Her husband's name was Herber. Uh, and he was a friend of the oppressing king Jaban. So I can only imagine, I mean, if you're a nomad kind of person and you're coming into a foreign land, just like if you're coming from another country, the first place you're going to go to is the consulate, going to get your visa, listen, am I allowed to stay in this country for a little bit? So I can only imagine that he went to the king and said, listen, I'm a small tribe. I'm just here for a little bit. Can I use some of your resources while I'm in your land? And when, so he becomes friends with the king. Maybe they broke bread together. Maybe they sat and had a long chat. All we know is that they were familiar with each other. So the king and Jahil's husband were friends. So when the general Sisera saw that he was losing this battle, losing this fight, he ran away. And the first place he goes to, he says, well, I know a little house. That little tent, I've got some allies. This is the tent of um, 
jail and harbor. So he says, I'm going to go there. For all intents and purposes, Jahil had every reason to hide Sisera. She takes him in. She says, sure, come, come, come into my home. I will help you. I just you. want to, that point, my wife was not prepared for this, so I'm just adding this in, right? Men, listen to this part carefully, <laughs> right? Man, this part is scary. Listen to this very carefully. Go. Yeah. So she says, come into my home. And if in this day and age, or even back then, if a man entered a woman's home and she was alone, yeah. automatically things would have been suspected of her, yeah. Yeah. right? Of their relationship. Maybe something on the side was happening. But no, in this instance, he was there looking for shelter. He was looking for a place to hide. So she takes him in and gives him all the comforts that he would expect. So she offers him something to drink. Or well, he asks for a glass of water. She says, no, no, no. You're a guest in my house. I'm not going to just give you a glass of water. I am going to give you some curdled milk. What does that do? That allows him to go into a state of comfort, to go and sleep and to rest. And in his mind, well, I'm in a safe place. I can lay my head in this home. Little did he know that he would find his demise. What is intriguing is that the story doesn't say that Jahil was working One with second. Deborah. She killed him. <laughs> so that you guys know that. I don't want to use those words. Hang on. Let me be clear about that, men. And what she did was she used the tent peg and she pierced it through his skull, Mel. Guys, I don't want to be so... That's what she did. Uh, you understand. So... Uh, for the young men not yet married and to be married, we'll talk about that uh, in our next Stronger Together se session. Please continue. So like I said, the Bible doesn't talk about her working with Deborah. She doesn't talk about her even having a relationship with Deborah or Barak. The Bible does not say that God spoke to her to kill him. Mm. Jahil was not an Israelite. We know this because she was a Kenite. And she had nothing to gain from his demise. Quite frankly, she might have been persecuted for what she did. Although the story does not fully expand for her reasoning, scholars believed he might have abused her. Or she was privy to the know that he was abusing women around her. And in this time, Jahil saw the opportunity to get rid of a man from this cruel world in what we know as Sisera. She unknowingly fulfilled the word of God that was given to Deborah, yeah. as God had told Deborah that a woman would kill Sisera. So when Deborah went into battle and Barak asked her to come with me, the first thing she said is, I will go with you, but the honor for our freedom will not go to you. It will go to a woman. Jahil could not stand by and watch such injustice prevail by seeing Sisera walk free. She could not stand by and do nothing when she saw the opportunity, she took it. Deborah goes to write a beautiful poem detailing the victory of the God of grace. So when we look at Jahil, we know she understood the suffering that was happening around her. Whether she was part of the suffering, we do not know. But we know that as women, we know this, when somebody is going through something, we might talk about it. We might know or understand what somebody else is going through. And the one thing that this story really teaches me, and if you know me, I am that woman that if I find out that something is not right or if somebody is in distress, give me a call and I will be there. I thought when I was reading this that maybe I was a Deborah. Maybe I was the one that God is going to speak to and he's going to say, you are going to be the brave one. But as I continued look, looking at the word, I realized, no, I'm more of a jail. I'm definitely more of a jail. You can take that as you like, but I know me. She's my person. <laughs> it's why I'm so close to God. Amen. <laughs> as a woman, 
we have great, a great voice. As women, we have great intuition. We know when something is amiss. We know when the person next to us is not well, when they are falling. And it is our, our opportunity, our grace, not to look at that person and say, oh, look at her, oh, no man, she's, she's not doing well. Look at her fall, look at her fail, look at her not being great. But look at me, I'm the one who's, you know, I'm, I've got it all covered, God's got me. We are, that is not what we are called for. God put us on this earth to be helpers. Some would say we are there to help our husbands, but we are also there to help each other. We are there to mother the people around us. We cannot look at our own circle and only focus on ourselves and only focus on what's happening in our house when the world around us is falling apart. Amen. Amen. As women, we are soldiers in the army of God. So let's be ready to carry out the vision and the plan of God with our lives. We must be ready to go into battle. We might not physically be jumping on horses like Deborah or sticking a peg through a man's head like Jehiel or shooting down giants like David. We need to be so strongly rooted in the word of God and so prayed up that when the enemy comes our way, we need to be able to say, I know what to do. I know that I've been called to be great. I know I've been called to be brave and not sit down and be silent while the things around me are going array. Excellent. <laughs> so at this point, we'd like to bring it together, right, as we reach uh, our conclusion. But I'm led this morning to a very just, long conclusion. I'm just led this morning to talk just for a second around JL killing Sisera. It's come to me at this point. And we're going to talk it through in our conclusion. There are certain non-negotiables as a brave believer that we have in our marriage, in our home, in our parenting style, in whatever it might be. And between Tamara and I, we do not and would never accept abuse towards women and children. We don't stand, we don't tolerate it. In fact, Tamara said it very beautifully, but the truth of the word of, of the scholars in the word of God says that Sisera was known for raping women. He was known for taking women as his prize after winning a battle. And part of the reason why Jael killed him is because she knew this about him. And some scholars even believe that he raped her or tried to rape her. Okay. Now, this story is powerful. And let me tell you that when we were preparing it, I was also excited and intrigued as I learned and read through it. And I got to say that we should stand up against abuse towards children and women. Amen. Don't stand for it. Don't live with it. I stand here before you because I'm not trying to say I'm perfect, but I don't abuse my wife. I can say it from this pulpit. She's married to me for so many years, she's never known that. Yes, we have our arguments. Yes, we have our differences. Yes, we shout at each other sometimes. And we, we win really a fair shout. amount of battles. She wins equal to me. <laughs> but I got to say to you that if you are living in a home, stand up for righteousness. Men of the house, stand up. If you are weak, we're not condemning you. Come for help. Amen. Seek help. Come for prayer. We know what it's like to be a man in this modern day. We know that marriage is not easy all the time. We know relationships are not easy. But violence is not the answer. Abuse is not the answer. Hurting the ones that live with us is not the answer. Christ is the answer. And trust me from a testimony I can tell you. God can take the worst of us. And make us into the best husbands. And the best fathers. And the best leaders. Trust me, you can even get away with looking successful and being successful. But if you are a horrible man, I'm speaking to the men, it will catch up with you. It will catch up with you. They are the greatest and the smartest and the best looking. But when they fall because of abuse, they will fall. And unfortunately, the devil is a cruel taskmaster. He will let you get away in secret. 
He will even bless you with evil blessings. Mm -hmm. And then he will expose you publicly. And he will not just take the physical evil blessings that he gave you, but he will take your honor. He will take your name. He will leave you in the dirt. And if you don't come right, he will also take you to hell for eternal persecution. We don't stand for that. Jael saw that and took our opportunity to rid the world of an evil, abusive man. Now, in our wrapping up, firstly, I want to say, to be a brave believer. One, we must realize that our courage and bravery comes from our faith in our God. Comes from our God. When I talked about vision, I said our vision comes from God. Everything that is good and honorable and pleasing comes from God. One of my favorite scriptures, Psalm 20 and 7 says, Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord. In the story of, of Deborah, Jabin and his army were known for the heavy iron chariots. They were known to have some of the most powerful. In the modern day, it would be powerful tanks, powerful equipment. But on the day of the battle, God sent rain. Amen. Rain like a monsoon rain that made the ground so wet that their chariots was too heavy and sunk into the ground. Their key competitive advantage was taken away. God came in. God brought the rain. We must understand that some trust in chariots. But we trust in the name of our Lord. Amen. We trust in the name of our Lord. Deborah took courage in her faith in God. David took courage in his relationship with God. Knowing God from the time he was a shepherd boy. From a little boy. I took on the lion. I defeated him. I took on the bear. I defeated him. David stood in his experience in God. Both characters were upright in the sight of God. God could use them to be a brave believer. Therefore, man, it is the same old principles, but they don't change. Live holy, live by the word, live by prayer. I heard and, and watched a powerful sermon that recently said, if you have lost your desire to read the word of God and to pray, with respect and don't be afraid, you're currently directly under attack of the enemy. Do not be fooled. Do not be fooled. As children of God, our key weapons is prayer and the word of God. Band members, I encourage you, my people, if you are not reading the word, if you're not praying enough, you are, we are under the attack of the enemy. Let's stand up. Let's put it right. To the house of God. Live in communion with God, a relationship with him. Realize that our walk is set apart. We cannot be like the world. I'm sorry. We cannot be like the world. We can be in it. We can do the work. We can make a difference. But we are set apart. And it is a good thing. We are called to be different. To be a brave believer, we need to make brave decisions. Yes, yes. yes this yes. means, though, we need to be constantly renewing our mind in the, in, in the word of God. Because the world is constantly changing and challenging our faith. Whilst we embrace change and new things, we must always test these things against the word of God and the truth of God. That we do not conform to this world, but we are guided by the word of God. Jael made a brave decision. She did not conform to the thinking of the time and social acceptances. She saw evil and had a means to destroy it, and she went for it. Amen. Now, one of the brave decisions that we have to make as believers is to not be unequally yoked with this world. We cannot be unequally yoked. Remember, the word does not say equally yoked. It says unequally yoked. That means one is heavier or one is lower or one is higher. And the one that is lower will pull down the one that is higher. If Tamara and I are yoked, then we are joined by the hand or by the neck and connected. And if I'm evil and if I'm lowly, I start to pull her down. Amen. We cannot be unequally yoked with this world. The world wants us to be woke. But as believers, we cannot be fast asleep to the evils of this world. My wife wrote that. 
The world is full of influences. Pastor Adrian said this once. What is influencing you and I every day? Who is influencing you and I every day? The question that I would like to pose is that as we live, and, and there's three things in this work world I want to challenge this morning. The first one is living my truth. There's only one truth. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. He's a son of the living God. He is the only God. There's only one truth. We identify as this and we identify as that. There is a clear indication that the identity of Christ is lost in mankind. If you know the truth, you identify with the truth. And if you identify with the truth, then Christ is your truth. Amen. Amen. All roads lead to one God. Mm -mm. I'm sorry. That's not the case. All books say the same thing. I'm sorry. That's not the case. The Bible is the only true gospel. It is the word of God. It is the instruction of God. It is the Holy Spirit of God living as the word of God said. It is God himself in those pages. We don't believe that all gods are the same. We don't believe that all roads lead to the same God. We don't believe that if you believe in love, you believe in all religions. We don't believe that. We believe in the one true God. His name is Jesus. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This is the truth that we have to live. We cannot be unequally yoked. David had to overcome ridicule of his brothers and the irritation. Yeah. So now we're looking at being brave in our marriages, parenting, and family. Deborah had to overcome, overcome the stereotypes of a society, being a brave woman. Jael, even though her husband was friends with the king, she stood for righteousness. What are the biblical standards you and your spouse live by? What are the biblical standards you raise your children by? What are the spiritual non-negotiables in your family? We touched on this in our Stronger Together. What are some of your marriage non-negotiables? In our home, serving God is a non-negotiable. I was brought up in this house. So when I don't serve God, I feel like something is missing. I feel like something is wrong. I know that there's more to this life. Yeah. Sitting yeah. by and doing nothing means that we are not growing in God. Not so long ago, I was getting a little bit stagnant and not being involved in the house enough, especially after COVID. My mom said to me, Nigel, when are you getting back up on stage? When are you getting back up and playing the guitar? As old as I am, as being in the house as long as I am, our parents are a blessing. And my mom said to me and reminded me what I'm called for mm -hmm. and what I'm called to do in the house. In the book, Family Driven Faith, the author says, we cannot continue to send our children to Caesar and be surprised when they come back as Romans. We send our kids to school. We allow them to look at the phones. Bishop and mom spoke on that. They watch TV. They have their friends. All of those things are indication that that is Caesar. Our kids need to be so educated in the home on the things on the word of God. They need to be so grounded in the things of God that when the world says you are this and you are that, they can say, no, sorry. I serve a living God and I know who I am. Whilst we continue to send our children, education really does need to come from the home. Yes. We, can, we can send our kids to Sunday school, but if it's not found in our home, if our children cannot see the examples that we as parents, we as adults set, when they go out, they can be like, oh, okay, it's fine. I can do that. No, it's fine. My, mo my mother's not going to give you any rules. It's okay. I can do that. There's one of the things that we, and is a, like a really a non, non, non-negotiable, and, and it might come as a, but it's like sleepovers. 
My yeah. kids ask me this all the time. And I think to myself, and when I grew up, well, sleepovers was a big no-no. It was no way it was going to happen. And I, and I remember I used to really argue with my parents. But now, as I become a parent, I see the value that my parents found. I see that when we send our kids to a place that we don't know, where we are not, or when we don't know the parents, we don't know what our kids are being exposed to. Yeah. We don't know yeah. the dangers that our kids face when they go out. So definitely 100%, if you are not educating your children and living a godly life at home, when our kids go out there, it's free for all. It really is. When I look at some of the kids, my things my kids are exposed to, as small as they are, it scares me for them to get older. It scares me for them to see the real world. Because I hope as a parent, as parents, we are doing a good job that they know right from wrong. That really is the crux of a being a believer. Is as much as we follow God, do we know and understand when something is right and when something is wrong? Amen. Finally, we've got to be brave in defending the faith. We must take a stand. We must arise. We must answer the call. The answer must always be, yes, Lord. No matter what the question, yes, Lord. It must be an Aineni answer. Amen. I'm ready, Lord. I'm ready. We have to defend the faith. We have to be the David spirit in a Goliath world. David said, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. When Deborah was called to the battlefield, she said, surely I will go. Deborah was brave and went into battle. The time to answer the call is now. Get involved in the ministry. Get involved in the kingdom. Stand on your faith to do something for the work of the Lord. In closing, I'd like to ask, are you struggling to keep the faith? Do you find yourself constantly thrown around by the things of this world? Are you looking for answers on what it means to be a Christian? Do you want to know more about Jesus? Do you need help with your unbelief? Do you need to make a quality decision again to follow Jesus? Maybe you feel backslidden. Maybe you feel downhearted. Be brave. 